Yo, what's up, people? I'm your host, Jay Will, and I would like to welcome you to Inspire Guys People, where we balance faith and business to guide you to your purpose. Today is all about being a Christian content creator. I have a guest, Alexandria Crisell. Uh, she's a photographer and educator. We're going to have a dope conversation today. Um, but look, man, hopefully y'all are, you know, living it up, doing well and uh, having a good Saturday. You know, I don't do uh, Saturday shows super often, but I actually think it's pretty dope because ain't nobody. Well, I can't say ain't nobody at work, but the snow is melted here in Michigan. That's a plus uh, the Lions winning. U of M won a national championship, so we doing good in Detroit. And I'm going to tell you like this. Craziest thing to me is that the Detroit Lions are unifying the city of Detroit in ways that I have never seen before, like legitimately unifying the city. And it's dope to me because especially the last four years, y'all know how it is. People ready to be mad at each other. For any and everything, politics, color, your skin, you live across the street on the left side, I live on... It's like all these reasons for everybody fighting and tripping. So I'm just going to be real. It's been a blessing to me because I'm like being, you know, in and around the city of Detroit, as some people corrected me, like the state of Michigan is united. And that is facts. Um, but it's like everybody being nice. You know, all the stores selling out of their merchandise. You got Lions gear left and right. So let's hope the Lions keep winning. You know what I'm saying? So God could keep blessing the state of Michigan. And, uh, you know, that's that. But today we're going to have a conversation around Christian content creation. And so if you're a Christian content creator or someone who has, maybe you got a youngin that's like, you know, you're trying to train your child up in the way they should go and figure out like how they can get some content of substance to help them on that journey. That's what Inspire Guys People is all about. Having these real conversations, you know what I'm saying? To really kick it and pick someone's brain. Uh, Alexandria is, uh, like I said, a photographer. Um, she has a youth program, the young, uh, the young influencers, and she's someone that I've just kind of followed for a long time on social media. And I'm really impressed with people who are consistent. That's something that always stands out to me because let's just be real, especially you follow people on social media. Sometimes people are all over the place, but she's been consistent. I've watched her kind of from afar, really low key would love to do a photo shoot with her other than the fact that she just like is we know we're near each other i'll put it like that we both in michigan but where she at and where i'm at ain't nowhere near each other so that's the only reason i never reached out to her for that excited to pick her brain um and learn a little bit about her life and her journey and not just the things that she's done but the things that god has planned in her life and that she's gonna do so without further ado Y'all welcome Alexandria to the show. What up, Alexandria? Hello, hello, How you doing? hello. I am doing great. I'm doing great. But I before we start, you said we are nowhere near each other. And I just want to point out that people from Detroit think that our ride from Flint to Detroit is so far. And it's just a <laughs> hop across the town pond. So we're gonna we're gonna make it work because I'm in Detroit often and it's not far. Okay. <laughs> no, no. So let me let me clarify too, because you speak in facts, yeah. but this is me. Being from Detroit and not actually living yeah. nowhere near Detroit. You feel what I'm saying? So there we go. Um, I made an assumption. That's, about that. <laughs> that's that's what it is. Um, but that don't mean we still can't make it work. So let's make it work. Cause okay. I'm in Detroit a lot too. I'm in Detroit okay. all the time. I don't live that far, but it's like, you know, when people like you looking like, ooh, man, like all right, that's a hike. But uh, we can yeah. make it work. Welcome to the show. You. you know what I'm saying? Thank How you. How are you feeling I'm today? So I'm feeling good. I'm excited. I'm excited. My favorite things to talk about is faith and life and everything below the surface. And so I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation. That's dope. How's your um, new year off? Like, you know, we still one month into the year. I don't know if you're a new year resolution person, goals or whatever you do, but what's that looking like? How you, how you, how you feeling one month in? I'm feeling like I need to catch up a little bit. <laughs> Um, okay. I'm not much, not much of a new year's resolution person, but my birthday actually falls at the end of the year, December 22nd. So at the end of every year, I'm always like reflecting a lot about the year before and kind of what want to do moving forward. And so I, um, this year is just a lot of transition. It's a lot of, um, ambiguity. And so really I'm just trying to kind of find my way into newness 
without really seeing a lot. And so just trying to take the vision that I have and the things that I want to do and start kind of step by step building into what's going. So what's going to happen in the future. So there's a lot of a lot of things happening um, and it's a busy time, but I'm just trying to sort everything kind of. That's a real place. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like so many times these days we all feel this pressure to like have it all figured out and maybe like present ourselves as having it all figured out. So I kind of love that you just like, yo, like this is about newness and I'm figuring some things out. I um, I started writing this song this week um, called Faye, F-A-I, um, which is a variation of like me, a play on words of faith. And okay. like the whole point of the song is that I'm figuring things out. Everything isn't clear yet. So it's like this journey of faith. So that like when you said that, it's kind of dope to hear um, yeah. just kind of where you are. What is like, is it anything specific that you could share that's like something new? Like you said, there was newness, ambiguity. Like, what does that look like for you specifically right now? Okay, so it starts really at last year. So I'm about two days away from the anniversary of my mother passing away. And my mother Sorry passed away. Thank you. Thank you. It was unexpected. It was difficult. It was traumatic. It was a it was a lot of things. Um, and so I started off the year with a lot of grief, grief with that grief with grief with my roles changing. Um, I um, work with youth a lot and I had a daughter that had but been a mentor that became a daughter. And so transition there and with relationships and kind of just some things changing there, um, business changing, life changing. And so last year was really just like trying to figure out um, how to how to make my way through grief and all of these other things that are happening at the same time. And when my mother passed away before, like the Lord had been talking to me about um, to everything, there's a season. And for me, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, the Lord's telling me things are gonna change. You know, we were in the midst of some difficulty and I, there's things that I have been waiting on the Lord to be do, do for like a few years and maybe even a decade. And I'm like, okay, the Lord's saying that these things are happening. But right at the tail end of, me thinking I'm going into newness and it's going to be kind of all this good. It really came came at the beginning of a lot of devastation. And so it was hard to go from being very excited and very like looking forward to all of these things and then feeling like, man, I'm back at the bottom. <laughs> and I want to be excited because I know you're still saying that these things are going to happen, Lord. But like my heart's devastated. Life has completely changed. You know, my dad, my brother, like we're just trying to figure everything out or at least trying to submit to God's sovereignty and what has happened while also trying to figure our own hearts out and stuff. And so my year was really a lot of that. And so coming into this year, it's like, okay, well, I have a business. My youth program's running. I'm trying to pivot my business into something else. I'm still trying to deal with the emotional, I don't want to call it fallout, but just the emotional and kind of spiritual grappling that comes with the things that I've experienced the, the year before. And so um, it's really just a continuation of the year, right? Of just learning how to, when things are shaken and when things are outside of our control, how do we then kind of find our stability? Like, and so I did too much talking that I don't remember the initial question, but that's kind of like the context of like the, the craziness and like, I don't know what's happening. Relationships are changing. My roles are changing. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to leave everything behind and become something new to walk into the newness while also trying to hold on to, you know, hold on to what was a little bit. And so it's like you said, you have no idea. Like you try to control it, you try to make sense of it. But when it's happening, you're really learning that you kind of have to learn how to let go of all of the old stuff to let something become new. And that's just not comfortable. <laughs> that's not comfortable. No. It's unpredictable. <laughs> It's just, it's hard. <laughs> it's really yeah. hard. No, well, sorry <laughs> to hear about your mom for sure. And uh, thank, thank you. you for sharing that. Like that's, thank you. that's real though. You know what I mean? And and I can understand like, you know, um, it, I can understand generally speaking, like just this idea of like, you know, walking into newness sometimes, like not all change is because everything was good. And so yeah. like, how have you though, it sounds like you have you and your family have still, like you're leaning on the Lord through this time. How has your relationship with the Lord been affected or challenged um, kind of as you go throughout this process? Deeply. <laughs> um, I think before I talk more about that, the, the, 
the, I think what I enjoy about myself and what I appreciate is a lot of times I can see what the end thing is supposed to produce. So I have no power over my mother passing away and all of these things, but I understand that if I can endure long enough or if I can try to find my way through at the end, I'll be able to comfort somebody else or I'll be able to know the Lord in a new way or I'll be able to um, the crushing will bring a, a greater anointing or a great greater opportunity. Like I know that nothing is lost in the Lord, but at the same time, I had never had anybody close to me pass away. And my mother was the closest person to me. My yeah. mother could call me and be like, Hey girl. And I'm like, what's wrong? Not because there was anything that would indicate it. She was like, what you talking about? And I'd be like, uh, -uh what's wrong? She's like, I didn't even change my voice. And then she would go to be like, Oh, well you, maybe I'm feeling down or, and so like me and my mother were close. And we were close because we were friends. We were close because my mom discipled me and my gifts. Um, my mother was a person, was probably one of one of the people who I know the most, who just spent a lot of time with the Lord and waited on the Lord and lived her life um, just uncompromising for the Lord. She had a strong personality, but she had strong gifts. And so I was able to watch my mother like the Lord would tell my mother something she made, if she could, she'd share it with me. And then we'd wait to see if it happened. She was like, we need to see if this is me or the Lord. And my mother just never missed, not because she's not per she was perfect, but because when people are that close and consistent with the Lord, you know, you just, you get to see that. And so having lost my friend, you know, my, my, my comforter, my counselor, all those things in one person, my parents are pastors and, and I minister at my parents' church too. It's like, there's that big shift. And so, Initially, when this happened, I was like, Lord, what is going on? <laughs> like how, like, I was, I was just shell shocked, right? I, I still feel very much so like eclipsed. That's the only way that I can explain it. It's like immediately life is different in the permanence of this. It's not just that I can see the end goal, but it's like now I have to learn how to live with something that is never going to change. <laughs> and so yeah. my, uh, the year's been tough emotionally. Like I felt Honestly, I felt in a lot of um, kind of torment mentally and stuff with a lot of things like um, trying trying to go to the Lord about stuff and trying to wait on the Lord for answers. And I asked the Lord anything. I'd be like, why is this happening? Like, I was like, Lord, you don't lie. So how come we're having these conversations about, you know, the Lord is bringing us into this. I was feeling like the Lord was going to do some healing in some thing in some areas like in our family or just like like bringing us to a different level just in our relationships and communication with each other. I said, but how and how at the beginning of all of this, this happens. And so trying to trace God's finger steps, your finger foot, footprints and, and, and fingerprints on things was hard. Um, and it's still hard. But I. And I had thoughts that I had never had before. I was like, y'all, we in the matrix. I was like, this is, this is a simulation. <laughs> and I was like, I go from being so sure to feeling like I'm not so sure. And so I, I questioned a lot of things, but I took my questions to the Lord. And I still don't have a lot of answers. And I still feel periods of doubt or periods of just confusion. But I've also seen too much to be like, nah, this ain't real. Like you see people healed. You see all these, you see guys handing your life in very tangible ways. And it's just, you can't go back, but now you're trying to figure out how to move forward. And for me, it's been surrender. Like grief is really about surrender. Like, okay, I might not have all the answers. This sucks. This is uncomfortable constantly. I have to continue to surrender. I have to learn how to wait on the Lord. And um, I don't think people want to talk about that as much, right? Like that even in the most difficult times of your life, God can be using it to prune you or to bring you to like to, <laughs> you know, or to bring you into yeah um deeper consecration and i'm tired emotionally i'm tired i don't want to consecrate or i don't want to you know and so it's it's been a lot of that it's been a lot of this is how i feel this is what i see the end goal is but i'm too tired or or hey maybe just coming to you and talking is enough lord or it's really trying to figure out how to place myself and evaluate myself in my relationship with the lord what is he asking of me what does obedience look like what does healing look like what does grief look like uh, what does the fear of the Lord look like while also trying to grapple with God? Like, cause I'm wrestling with God, but God ain't wrestling with me. <laughs> <laughs> I like <that>. So, yeah. <laughs> so, wow. No, that's powerful. Um, that there's, there's so much in what you said. Um, and especially in the fact of like, what I love is that I can see the impact that your mom had on you. And like, sometimes we don't understand like what legacy is and like, that impact and how powerful 
someone's example can be like that godly example um so no i thank god for her in that sense and, and thank god for you you know just being uh vulnerable enough to share something that personal um yeah with, I, you also kind of talked a little bit about um you you mentioned that you took on uh, if i heard you right uh, a mentee and became like a mother yeah. i, I want to say you said that and this yeah, happened around the same time can you do you mind sharing a little bit just about that dynamic of kind of now mm -hmm. it seems like you're maybe in that role in that mother role um mm -hmm. and, and kind of how you're approaching that during this time of change so it actually goes back a little bit further so she's 20 now um i used to be a part of a, a youth program um working with young people is what i definitely feel called to um and uh during that time as i was exiting that youth program she had started coming to church with us and doing a lot of things um and eventually kind of became a part of our family. Like I heard in prayer one day, like the, the Lord was saying like, Hey, she's going to come live with you. And I was like, ah, I'm like, I'm still living with my parents. Cause I've just started my business full time and there's things going on. I'm like, what is like, I knew that the Lord was going to bring young people to me to help be a mentor and be a support to them. I didn't think that the Lord was going to do that while I was single, because who is going, why would the Lord willingly give me a whole child when, you know, there's benefit to having that balance. Right. But I was living with my parents. And so uh, I didn't say anything. And a few months later, some situations happened and she ended up coming to live with us and stay with us. And um, I became a full time parent. I went from a mentee role, a mentor role to kind of this parent role um, of a teenager with her own history, with her own upbringing, with her own challenges. Um, and uh, it was up until my mother passed away. I, I explained it as being the most sanctifying thing that I've ever done, because you know, when you're a person that's used to helping people, like, you know, you're used to being a, a voice of reason and trying to talk and walk with people through stuff, but it's different when you're with someone all the time, right? Like you're married, people are married, people have children. It, the dynamic shifts some, <laughs> you know, your love and your your um, desire to help and support people doesn't change, but then you realize like, okay, like there has to be a little bit more accountability because you're in my space and I'm in your space, or you yeah. can't really hide from the things that you are, are doing. That's me as an adult, her as a child, my parents, you know, and so, it was it was the most beautifully challenging thing I've ever done. Um, and I think the biggest thing is that for her, it's like the Lord shows you something different to give you an opportunity to make some, you know, make some different decisions. And, to, and hopefully that those seeds planted begin to sprout up in your life either soon or later. And for me, it's uh, I'm called to young people. And so the Lord is using this to sanctify me and to strengthen me and to give me the tools and the things I need also as I go out. Um, and he sends more people to me to do the work that I have to do. And a lot of that also informs my youth program because, you know, young people in social media is such a large thing. I got to live firsthand what it looks like um, with the young person and the influences that social media has, how people interact with it, how they interact with it, how it how it hurts them, how it helps them. And um, so those things, um, it was a challenge because everybody also deals with grief differently. So she lost a grandmother when my mother passed away. But, you know, everybody's coping coping mechanisms are different. And like I said, it came on the heels of a very challenging year prior. And so and she's becoming a young adult. So you 19, 20, you, you know, you want to be out here, you trying to figure it out, you trying to figure yourself yeah. out. And so it's just, a, um, you know, it's challenging. I felt like last year, I also grieved, you know, that relationship in that sense. But I mean, when I went to college, my mom grieved me going to college. So, you know, it's just, it's just a For transition sure. of everything. <laughs> Got it. No, that's, I mean, look, you, that, that those are some impactful relationships, right? And I, I guess I'm curious, how did you, like you mentioned, being a person that, that kind of helps people and people come to you, um, where did that come from? Like, where, where did that desire, how did you find your way to understanding that part of your purpose? Because um, it seems super clear. Yeah. So I think Part of it's calling and part of it's God using some hurt to to for his for his glory. <laughs> um, I yeah. think I've always been a very like disciplined and focused person. I've always been a very kind and like empathetic person. I think that some of the giftings that the Lord had, like, you know, you just people talk and you understand what's going on, even though they're not talking about what's going on. And um, so for me, I think that there's some things that the Lord placed in me where it was just like that was a part of it. But then also when I was young, I um. I remember being hurt by a friend unintentionally, but I felt kind of rejected and abandoned by her. And I remember as a kid saying, I'll never, 
I'll, you know, you're eight years old. I'll never, I don't want anybody to ever feel like I felt. And I think for a long time that distracted me from kind of the deep focus I used to have. It made me very like, I want to make sure that nobody's left out. I want to make sure that everybody is taken care of. And so um, with the leading of my mom often, like, girl, you, you know, you got to have some wisdom and your compassion and things like that. But it's been really difficult over the years for me to kind of separate those things. And so I think that my heart to want to help people and for people to have a space and a place um, came kind of out of that. And just growing up and having my mom and having really, really dope people behind me, like supporting me, loving me, encouraging me, telling me about myself. <laughs> um, mm. I think bringing those things together um, just kind of made it always really clear to me that I just want to be able to help people. Like for me, it's very fulfilling to help people. But in my adulthood, and especially in this last year, it's been a the Lord like reminding me like, you can help people and, and there's some training and preparation, but then there's time to execute. And you have to lock in and allow people to be where they're at or allow people to make the decisions that they make. And you can't fix it. You're not Jesus. You're not the Holy Spirit. You know, you can't come in and fix. Um, and so I've also been learning how to pull back a lot um, so that I can make sure that I'm getting done the things that I need to get done um, so that I can impact the way that I that the Lord wants me to. And not just based off emotion. Right. Yeah. Have you found that to be difficult? Like when it's time for you to pull back and not help someone? Because it seems like that probably comes naturally for you. Yeah. Um, ha has that been difficult? Have you had some trial and error with that of like knowing when to do it, when not? Like, how's that, how's that process been? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm much better than what I was. I think that um, this year has taught me that I don't have no time to waste. I don't have time to waste. And I, and I think that what has informed me maybe staying around longer or or having a hard time tearing away is it's kind of like you know that people need support even if they don't think they need support you know that they need it and i think because i i'm a gap filler like in high school i played sports that i'd play point i'd be uh, i wouldn't be a shooting guard i'd have no jump shot but i might be point i'd be a small forward i you know i'd be over right. here i played volleyball i was a outside hitter that they put me in setting you know, in track, I'm doing this, like in, in work, as I'm working jobs, they're placing me in a lot of different places. I think that when sometimes when your skill set can be used broadly, you get used to being used broadly. And um, the difficulty sometimes is realizing that even though you can do a lot of things well, or a lot of things great, even that there's time and place for you to only do single things um, the, at, at the greatest level. And so I have struggled with that. I've struggled because you don't want to be mean to people. But or you're or feeling like, man, if I stick around long enough, I can help. You know, I can be there when you do fall because everybody's going to fall. But the Lord just basically told me, like, listen, if you put yourself at the center of everybody's help, then you, that's making yourself idle. You're making your ability to help people um, more effective than the Holy Spirit doing their work, his work in them, in their timing. And so it's not as hard as it used to be, but emotionally you still grapple. But decision wise, I'm, I'm leap, I, I make the decision like, Hey, I can't do that. <laughs> but internally you'd be like, Ugh. but yeah, after a while, it'll, it'll, that'll die down. Yeah. I, I can, I can relate to that. Like, you know, the whole, you know, my purpose being to inspire guys, people, yeah. um, and not that I'm always executing that perfectly. Right. But when you, when you are a person that's centered on helping other people, um, I think sometimes what happens is every person only sees what they bring to you. So it feels yeah. like to them, like, oh, yeah, you're just dealing with one thing. And it's like, no, nah, I'm actually like actually got six of y'all coming to me about stuff. <laughs> and then yeah. I'm, then I'm also human and I'm not perfect and I'm dealing with things. And I think, you know, I love that you kind of share some things vulnerably because I think what gets missed sometimes is that when you're a person that may be mature, or maybe you know, maybe yeah. the community around you consider you wise and things like that. And they come to you for stuff. People also tend to put you on a pedestal. And it's something yeah. that I, I am always fighting against people putting me on a pedestal because I'm like, you know, like I'm human. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I'm not God. So you have to understand that, like, just like you have struggles, I have struggles, too. And it's funny because I was thinking this morning about Solomon randomly mm -hmm. and just some of the mistakes he made and it was like i just had this random thought of like it's crazy how wisdom doesn't exempt you from sin like 
you being wise doesn't <laughs> exempt you from doubt, losing faith, struggle, anything that everyone else goes through. So um, I think that's part of the importance, too, of like sometimes as a person that's always given of yourself, being able to say no so that you get replenished and that yeah. you're not like an empty vessel just pouring out nothing because it's like you haven't been replenished. And um, so I think that's important. So I appreciate you sharing. I that. agree. I agree. Because you 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 rid yourself of rest. It's like the one of the last um, podcasts you did where you guys were talking about rest and how important that is and how rest is a gift and how if we choose not to rest, we're also, in a sense, being disobedient or just kind of slapping God in the face because why do we think that we can accomplish more when God is saying, if you rest in me, you'll... So that's been a, that's been a very right. big like piece for me this year too, right? Like, no, God's asking you to rest. God is telling you not to worry about everybody else and lock in. And I don't think I did that well last year. Like, I knew that that's what the Lord told me. And I don't think I did it well at all. I'm like, my mom died. I want my family to, you know, we got to move together as a unit. We got to, you know, and I'm running here. I'm doing this emotionally. I'm doing a lot of stuff to try to behind the scenes. And God's like, that's not what I asked you to do. I'm like, but I'm trying to like, and then you just realize you're spent emotionally, physically, and people don't understand. <laughs> and even when they try to understand, but we got We have to rest. God can do yeah, more with our rest. Yeah, and that's how you get replenished, so you can keep going, yeah. right? It's like um, I think about race car drivers, and you go, they go on a long race with however many laps for however many hours. They got to stop and get tires changed. They got to stop and get gas. All type of things, you got to go into a pit stop. And if you don't make that pit stop, you end up dying out. Your car breaks down before you can even finish the race. And so I think yeah. a lot of times for us, we have to understand. I've been there plenty of times. Like, trust me, me like I'm, I can relate where it's like, <laughs> bro, like I got to chill. I got to go through a season of being quiet yeah. and just listening, a season of just reading my word and not, you know, trying to give everybody advice. I actually, it was yeah. funny. And I don't know if it was 21 or 22. But the word God gave me in that year was take your own advice. So I spent most of that year trying my Ooh. best not to give people advice and yeah. like trying not to tell because because you notice things when you are a person that like God uses in that way. You're just a noticer. Some people think yeah. you're being you criticize. It's not you're observing and you just notice like, oh, hey, that's that's off to the side. Right. Fix that. And mm -hmm. that year, God mm -hmm. was just like, no, I'll take your own advice. So I spent most of that year like, all right. Not telling nobody to get their stuff together. I'm 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 gonna listen to that. So I see everybody in the comments. Appreciate y'all. Gerardo, what up, what up? Gerard says, hey Dawn. How y'all doing? Gerard. Uh, Lou. That's my guy right Sorry. there. <laughs> I love Gerard. <laughs> yeah, Gerard is so dope. Hey, um, so appreciate y'all. Um, I've been knowing him so long. Like Gerard is one of the first people I, I tell him all the time. He's one of the first people that I know that like we used to travel together and we traveled mm -hmm. doing music. We was in a hotel one day and like I woke up, let's say it's like seven in the morning. You like get up. I'm yeah. looking like Gerard is like in the corner, yes. the, the shape, <laughs> reading the Bible. Pray. I'm like, oh, people. <laughs> and you know, we were young at the time. You know, you know, he's a little older than me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I was yeah. young, you know, not to throw it out there, Gerard. I ain't playing you. You still a young man, Bishop. Uh, but <laughs> at, at the time, I'm like. Oh, we really about this life. Like you up yeah. at six in the morning, like my mom's really reading the word. Yeah. So Gerard is solid. Um, love him. But um, Alexandria, I'm I'm curious about like, you know, so as we think about like content creation and some of the things you're doing, um, you talked about your um your um your youth program. So let's actually go yeah. there first, the the young influencers. Okay. I, I mean, it makes sense to me just hearing you talk. I, I can yeah. see how you would do that but tell us a little bit about the young influencers what led you yeah. here what's the vision and things like that mm -hmm. so the idea actually came about four or five years ago i was at the table with my mom and my best friend who's also from detroit shante and we were just talking about because she's a teacher so we were talking about just the different things that young people are going through and how different it is from our generations and kind of the struggle in that and how it was forming their mindsets and their identities and things like that, and just the things that they had access to. And um, in that conversation, I was like, how come people aren't, like we see all this content creation and all of this stuff for business owners and adults and things like that. I was like, how come people aren't doing this for young people? Like it's they're already on their phones all the time. Like, why aren't we trying to repurpose this in a way? So I did some research, I didn't find a lot. I remember back in, um, 
in college, I wanted to write a research paper on Facebook and how how Facebook impacted people's self-esteem. But at the time I couldn't do it because there was no research. This is like 2007 and there was no research. My teacher was like, yeah, you can't, my professor was like, you can't do that. And I was like, but we see that this is like causing some stuff. Like, but I understand I can't do a research paper when there's no research. But now we fast forward however many years that is, 16 years or whatever. And there's tons of research. And so when we were sitting at that table, I just, I took, I literally two days just sat down and wrote a really large vision for a program and curriculum and then like a nonprofit and all these things. And then I kind of started to try to get that in motion. I um, piloted the program at my old church um, in college when I was in Grand Rapids, Grace for the Nation Church, shout out to Nate and um, <laughs> Camp Judah. And I got to spend two weeks kind of teaching young people about content creation, mostly YouTube because the young people wanted to be YouTubers really bad and the older people wanted to be influencers. But um and then tried to kind of get it off the ground, but I was just going into business full-time by myself. Um, I, I have just became a full-time parent to my daughter. I was trying, you know, the COVID hit in the middle of all of this and I, it just kind of got tabled. Um, and so at the end of last year, I won a pitch competition for this to, and I ended up landing in some schools this year. And so it's it's evolved into, we're teaching kids the business and the technical side of content creation, but we're really using it as a vehicle to talk about mental health to talk about online, like responsibility and duty online and to really try to help. Social media is not going anywhere. So to really try to shape that, hey, we need to, you need to see this as a tool, not as something that's consuming you, but you need to go from kind of being a consumer to being a contributor. You need to understand that the way that the world is going is gig employment is going, is going through the roof and you're going to have to really know how to you know, work this thing, whether you want to be an entrepreneur or whether you work for someone's business, like social media is a large aspect of, of business and life at this point. And so really wanting to redirect young people who have a lot of access <laughs> and don't have a lot of gu guidelines, don't have a lot of boundaries, because um, those things impact your mind. Like you, kids are watching pornographic things online. Like kids are on their tablets watching kids stuff and parents have to monitor that to Man. figure out what they're seeing because people are putting all kinds of stuff on there right just because we know that we can plant seeds of influence in ways that sprout later so it's really about that like it's really about helping young people see it as a tool and being able to learn how to develop their own voice how to contribute what's unique to them to the world in a way that's um purposeful but also protecting of themselves like they need to understand that they're not a brand you're a person <laughs> and you also need to understand that getting millions of followers and a whole bunch of money is not going to solve your problems um, but if you're going to aim for this and shoot for it, then you also need to understand that there's a skill set behind this and that this is work and that there's strategy and that there's things that, um, you know, you, that can help you. And that's what we've been doing in the program this year. Um, and it's been great. It's been exciting. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you all for the love and the comments. People are enjoying. Um, Gerardo says he's proud of both of us. Thank you, brother. Um, you know, what I love about what you're doing with this program is that Look, A, you know, you like you said, you you you've looked into the research and understand like the yeah. research around what social media does, um, not even just to young people, right? To to everyone. All of us. Like I'm, <laughs> All I've of watched us. so many people, you know, in my age group like start falling a victim to stuff. And I it's yeah. easy to fall in that trap. But I what I like about what you're doing is that sometimes we spend a lot of time telling people what not to do versus trying to train and educate them on how to do it yeah. you know what i mean like you said yeah. it's like to kind of go from being a consumer to a contributor is super important because as a consumer on social media to me it's insane like you are very just it's very insane like just, <laughs> just like inputting information just upload like and it's hard to keep up emotionally with everything even me as an adult yeah. i'm like I know these kids got to be tripping because I have times where I just step away from social media for a month or two because I'm mm -hmm. like, there is no way possible for me to consume all of this imp information, emotion, anger, tragedy, um, conflict. It's like, it's all too much. I got to live my life within 20 seconds, right? And so what I love about what you're saying is like, let's guide these young people on actually how to use this because like you said, from a career perspective, um and just in in their lives it's gonna play a much yeah. different role than it did in in our lives um and and obviously it's playing a role in our lives moving forward but i'm yeah. i'm such a fan of of that kind of mindset so 
You so you sounds yeah. like you were you got into some schools now. Is that kind of the plan to yeah. continue to build out and get in more schools? Yeah, I want to link with organizations and schools that have, you know, they already have the audience, right? Definitely going to do some standalone things where we're doing some training for specifically for like youth who either own businesses or are looking to be entrepreneurs and things like that so that we can, you know, there's, we want to expose as many kids to the concepts as possible. But then for the people who are like, like, cause young, some people are decided that, Hey, I have this business or I have these ideas. Um, we want to be able to pour into also the people who are high achieving and want to actually do something with it. So there's exposure and then there's, there's strengthening um, the people who want to take this and run with it too. So um, I definitely have a long-term goal to, take the curriculum um, and and parse it out in some different ways and sell it and do some different things. Because me and a team of people can't be everywhere. But I think that when I look at broadly, like how much deception and confusion and how much like our young people are tied up in social media in a way that has them kind of blinded, I think that it's important that how we're going about this and, and how we're going to structure it um, can be multiplied and you have to be willing to kind of put things out there for it to be multiplied. So I definitely have a, a goal to do that as well because. No, I, I love that. <laughs> yeah. No, go ahead. Finish your thought. I'm sorry. I oh no, that, that that's basically it. Um, I was okay. going to throw a statistic out there. The, um, the surgeon general came out with a, um, a report last year on adolescence and social media. And they said, they gave two statistics that were really startling, but then they, the kind of, summation of the report was crazy. So 90% of teenagers, 13 and 17 are on social media right now. You're supposed to be able to be 13 to get onto these uh, platforms, but 40% of eight to 12 year olds are already on social media. So when you look at the vast amount of kids who are interacting with this, at the end of the report, it said a lot of good things. It said some of the benefits of it, it said some of the negatives, but it said that we cannot say that social media is necessarily safe for people. Like basically through our research, we can't give out a statement. And so that alone is very jarring, right? Like there's all this research and these things that are happening. So how are we going to meet kids where they are to help them move through this stuff? <laughs> um, and so that's, an, that, that's, that's kind of like some of the statistical things behind it that makes it important too. Cause we see it's, we see it's all consuming, but those numbers say something, something even crazier to me. <laughs> Yeah, especially the the forty percent of eight to twelve that are on there. You're supposed to be thirteen to get there, and I've seen that. Yeah. Like I've I've seen that with my own eyes, seeing young kids on there. And I tell you, like a lot of times, me and my wife kick it, and we don't have children, so you know, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to tell people what to do with their kids as somebody right. who doesn't have children. Just as an observer, though, um, what's interesting to me, and then thinking about being a kid myself yeah. growing up, I'm like. There is no way possible. I'm I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about nobody else. There is no way possible. You could have grabbed me even at 13. What's that like seventh grade or something? Uh, mm -hmm. Eighth grade, whatever it is. Seven, I think that's seventh grade. You couldn't have caught me in seventh grade and brought me this device and was like, hey, whatever you type in here, it'll pop up. <laughs> and then trust me with it. Like, I'm just telling you, like, if you trust me with that at 13, you out of your Man. mind. And so I think what happens, because you mentioned it, you like kids are watching pornographic things. Uh, a lot of yeah. what happens, I think, is that parents are blind to the reality of their own children. Like everyone yes. is almost conditioned to see their own child as like, he's just a sweet angel. Mm -hmm. Isn't she loving and caring? <laughs> and I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I remember being in elementary kids was cussing in kindergarten. Like, yes. so... You have to see your kids through the the lens of reality and understand so. you can't trust, you can't just trust them with something so powerful, a portal into any realm that they want to enter. That's literally what social media is. You can go in these search tools. Yeah. Like, it's too much for some of us adults. Anything Let's be real. Will. Oh, for, for, we weren't built for this. <laughs> we weren't built for everybody's opinion. We weren't built for all this information like this. We weren't built it's for too much. <laughs> That. It's too much. And even, you know, even for me, like I, I constantly have to try to guard myself and revise my plan and, and, and like, all right, like I because in, and the reason is because you said it, all these opinions, all these perspectives, everyone is an expert. They never share their experience, though. And again, you give that you give this to adults <laughs> and we lose our minds. You're raising children in this. It's a very dangerous Undeveloped thing. So brains. Again, <laughs> Undeveloped oh identity. 
and, and you're just shaping them. And and it's like what you said about being a parent. You're like, I don't want to necessarily tell parents what to do and stuff. And a part of what we want to do is later on down the line, educate parents. Because when I was coming into, you know, being a parent to, to my teenager, it was like, I had to take your phone sometimes. I had to take social media. You probably thought it was really whack. And you was the only one that had some restrictions at 16, 17. But if things someone has to has to do has to give the boundaries right like if parents are doing everything that they want to on their phones and on their phones constantly it's really hard to hold a kid accountable not to do those things why because are you leading by example or are you just telling me not to do something and so like we're all wrapped up in this but like for young people we're like this generation doesn't know what life is outside of blue lights and and always having a tablet like we had the tv and we had things that still stimulated us i don't want to act like we went from nothing to something but right our young people don't know what stillness in their mind is we played outside we did different things like you know like everything is instant gratification is instant embarrassment is instant um whatever you want to do is instant and there's no sense of like boundary so how then as a young person if your mind is always doing this and you've taken in a thousand videos in a day, you've read sad stuff or you've read happy stuff. You, you know, you come over here, you read 12, listen to 12 mindset videos. How do you place yourself in that when your parents, you know, either don't realize that they need to help you navigate this or they don't want to, (laughs) or there's other factors like, you know, poverty or abuse or different things that make that pile all of this stuff on, on top, um, on top of each other when we work with our students, I found that they're very money motivated. You know, scamming all these things is on is on the rise. It's like the things that are motivating them. We're 30, we're like, I'm gonna get me a, you know, when I'm, when I get a big girl job, I'm gonna get me a Benz. You know, we thinking like, you know, right. I'm 30, I'm gonna get me a house. You know, these kids are 14, 12, 13, 14. They want designer, Montclair. I don't even know what half this stuff is. Oh, you, you know, they want all of this stuff <laughs> at this young age. Like they want, you know, at 16, I want, I want to scat, you know, they, it's like, there's no concept of like the things that you're seeing at a young age come later on or come with a certain amount of work. And it's because you just get fed all of this stuff so much that, and that's not everybody. Cause some people have boundaries and guidelines and parents that are able to pour into them, but, but it still is affecting the mindset, you know, of everything, yeah. relationships, how you see yourself, what you want to buy, how you spend money. How you trying to present to the world? You know, it's it's all consuming. <laughs> and it's what and look and, do in twenty years. And, and man, and it's scary because if we being real about it, not only is it all consuming, it's challenging to fight. So again, yeah. I'm talking like as an adult, and I think part of the issue is, and as you kind of you kind of alluded to it, is that the parents themselves are trapped in the loop as well. So what's happening is these children are left to navigate this world themselves because they're seeing their mom and dad trapped in the same thing, like trying to impress, trying to find their identity yeah. the same way. You know, my thing is, again, I try to be real about it, even when I think about like this podcast, right? Yeah. I know, you know, I work in sales and marketing. I have, my degree is in marketing. Um, I view marketing as mind control, as a form of mind control. So I understand the good (laughs) and the bad of marketing. And one of the biggest challenges when you are out here trying to create content responsibly is like, all right, I know the kind of shows and topics I could do that would just have this show on fire. I know the Mm -hmm. type of things that you could show people that will make people react a certain way. But my beliefs, my standards, my morals... I have to look them in and face them every day and say, what is Inspire Guys people? What do you yeah. want it to be? And my goal is, I always say, I would rather meet, reach 100 people deeply than a million people on the surface. And so that is what you know I try to remind myself of daily so that I don't fall into the loop of the likes, the just the comment. And again, I appreciate, yeah. this is not to say I appreciate the people who genuinely consume this content, but I don't want to start catering content to what everybody likes because the reality is people love the surface these days. Nobody Ooh, they love the surface. 15 <laughs> seconds, right? So yeah. how do you as a content creator though, like how do you manage that? How do you navigate as a creator, mm-hmm. as a person that's putting content out into the world? 
um, through your photography, through your programs or whatever mm-hmm. else it may be? Like, how do you kind of think through all those things? So I'll be honest, I wouldn't even consider myself a content creator. I would consider myself myself as someone in multimedia that has the skills to be able to teach people how to be a content creator, you know, right? And so Got I it. say that because I don't do stuff online. My, you know, my personal page is private um, because I used to be in education and I would tell my students, y'all can't follow me. You know, I was, they were college students <laughs> and stuff. But I was like, y'all can't follow me. My life is, my life is private. I ain't doing nothing crazy, but y'all still can't follow me. And right. so then I have my business page, my business pages. And to be honest, I'm teaching people things, but I need to do better at it. You know, I'm not consistent online. So I think, um, but I think I agree with you is that when I do show up, I'm showing up as myself, (laughs) you know, however quirky or different or crazy that is, or, you know, um, I think that I don't, I don't have a desire to not be who I am. If people don't like me how I am, or people can't accept me how I am, then those just aren't my people, (laughs) you know, or, you know, so I, um, yeah, I don't think that I'm I'm that great at that. But as a creator, I think I, I anything I do, I want to do it well. I want to try to do it to the best of my ability. I want to try to do it with the right heart. I want to try to do it with the right mindset. Integrity is of the utmost importance to me. Um, and so I think that that's kind of the quick <laughs> the quick approach to it. Yeah, no, but you 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 said something important, and you play an important role as someone who is not necessarily creating the content, but you're educating. Yeah young people on the content. So that's where that perspective is super important um, to, because you have an opportunity to, you know, um, you know, give them wisdom and guide them. Right. And, you know, that's what, that's what this show is about guiding people to their purpose. And I think so many young people right now are um, navigating and traveling through life without a guide or they have these guides that are, um, you know, pointing them in the wrong direction. You talked about like designer yeah. clothes and all this unrealistic stuff that is like, you know, I deal a lot with poverty just because this is a faith and business yeah. show. And I'm, I'm like always trying to tell people like real rich people don't act like this. And they don't, a, they, they do don't, not, they don't, they don't. I'm around people with money all the time. Like people don't act you know, when you're in business and you're, you know, I'm, I deal I deal with C-suite people and organizations and, mm-hmm. you know, the conversations that you're having when you're out at dinner and things like that is about people yeah. going to Lake Tahoe or the mountain they climbed or whatever. <laughs> it, it's not, it's not about they went and spent $600 on a t-shirt. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. That's robbing you of life experiences. So um, yeah. it, it's very interesting, man. Um some of these things. Can we talk um, b- before we get out of here? I want to I want to talk a little bit about your uh, your photography um, again. Um, I'm curious where, where maybe the desire to get into photography and, you know, what that uh, what fulfillment you get out of that um, that business, um, you know, so kind of the journey into it and then like, you know, yeah. what it's like being a photographer for you. Yep. So I fell into photography. I um, like I said, my background is in education. I worked in higher ed for a few years um, as a student. I did like as a pair pro doing like orientation, RA, all that stuff, and then end up pursuing that um, in grad school and then working in higher ed for three years doing student development and being a community director and things like that. And so photography happened because I was I worked at an art school. I worked at the Savannah College of Art and Design as a residence director. And one of the things I had said in undergrad was when I get a big girl job, I'm gonna go buy a big girl camera. I'm gonna get a real camera. You know, again, me at 18 asking for a camera, and then people, you know, some of our young people now at 18 ready to be on a yacht. You know, the, the <laughs> mentality was a little bit different. And people Very wanted different. stuff. We wanted stuff that we, you know, we couldn't afford and stuff back then too. But um, so I was at this school and one of um, our students uh, helped me find a camera. He was a photography uh, major and I started to do it a stress relief. And then I realized when I looked back in my life, I always had my point and shoot in college. I was taking, you know, the disposable cameras at the end of the school year. Like I actually enjoyed um, that. I feel like I'm a I'm a, a split in half of a very technical kind of brain and a creative brain. Like I don't I don't fall all the way over to one side. Um, and so. I started doing it for fun. And then of course you do it for fun and people ask you to do it. Like, how do you want to come shoot my wedding? You do not want that, but uh, thank you for thinking. So, (laughs) so I had a coworker and an old college friend asked me to do some work for them. One was a wedding. Um, But um, from there I was like, Oh, you know, I kind of do this on the side. I enjoy it. 
And fast forward to, I leave Detroit. I was working at, I ended up going to Detroit for a couple of years, working at Wayne State. And then I moved back to Flint because I was burnt out. I was like, I've come home for six months, figure out what I'm going to do, live off my savings for a little bit, and then kind of get back out there. Because um, I felt like I was far away from my desire and goal to do um, work with young people or in youth or work in trio programs or just, I, I had a very specific, like, I know I'm called to work with young people. You know, the older I get, it's always going to be more working with young people. But um it didn't work out. So I went home, got a job, ended up getting a job as a case manager. Um, and I got to work with young people, but then I got laid off and I was just tired. I was like, I'm tired of working for people who don't really care about young people or who don't have the ability to, to bring a vision to life. Um, they wanted me to do some stuff to bolster like their youth program, but they wouldn't really let me do the stuff. And it's because it was grant funded. And they wanted to hit certain metrics, but I'm like, we can hit metrics and we can impact lives. But it was just that tussle. So once I got laid off, I was like, I'm tired. So decided to go into business for myself full time. And at the time, the purpose was going to funnel to be to funnel a portion of that money to youth stuff. And I did that for a while, but it didn't quite work out. And then I just stayed doing photography um, and it's kind of bloomed and blossomed into all of this. So I'm self-taught, um, went to a conference in Detroit, met some great mentors and a great, great group of people that helped me grow. Um, and here we are. I don't know that. It's almost 10 years now, seven, eight, nine years or something later. Wow. And I found that God doesn't waste anything. Like it's literally been this great blend of what I'm called to in ministry, um, what I've learned as an educator um, and what I've learned administratively running programs to being a creative and also um, my like my life experience as a parent. And so the young influencers thing is really a, a combination of that and photography is really a, 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 a vehicle. <laughs> it was never like, I really love this. Like people often are like, oh, you're so passionate about photography. And I'm like, photography is not my passion. And they're kind of confused. Like, well, why are you doing it? Like, why? And I'm just like, I enjoy it. But my passion is young people. My passion is being a springboard and bringing a, being a sounding board for young people. And so I do a lot of high school, like senior photos and I do business branding and headshots and stuff. But working with high school seniors, is very meaningful because, you know, it's an important time in, in their life for them and their parents. And so I'm able to enjoy, I enjoy it, but it, it's all been leading up to kind of more of this other stuff. If I didn't I do photography how... ever again in life, I'd be fine as long as I was out here helping these young people navigate life a little bit better. <laughs> but but there's something dope in what you're saying, though, um, and I love it. And I don't even know that you're saying it on purpose, but I think sometimes people um, they can't see how their purpose um, kind of applies to things that they don't necessarily like in life. So it's like, you know, sometimes I'll be talking to young people that's you know, don't have a career yet and don't know what they want to do. And they like, yeah, I'm looking for something I love or whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, a lot of times what you love is wrapped inside and hidden in things you don't love, you know, Ooh. and you find out like, like for me, you know, it, inspiring God's people is my purpose. I've worked in corporate America for 17 years now and kind of worked my way up climbing the corporate ladder. Um, but what I found is when I was younger in my career, I thought there was no purpose in what I was doing in corporate. Like, now I want to go and do music. I want to do this creative stuff. And then what I ended up finding out was that, A, working through corporate America gave me opportunities to have real leadership jobs because a lot of times we say things about ourselves. I, I see a lot of people get on social media and they start talking as experts about things they haven't experienced. And it's like the idea of being a leader yeah. and being a leader is totally different. So God allowed me to be Ooh, in leadership roles. You feel me? Like, but God that's allowed me to be in these leadership roles in corporate America that then allowed me to apply the principles that I found in his word that when you talk about wanting to be a good leader um, and then I started to be able to exercise yeah. these things in real life. So now it's like this parallel path of being able to do things like this podcast where, you know, and yeah. go speak places at churches or whatever it may be. But my job allows me real life daily in leadership to see if I'm to give me an opportunity to um, to use the principles that I learned and try to because my goal, I want to be a great leader. That's one of my yeah. goals. I want to be a great leader. And you can't just do that if nobody if you're not leading anything. So you talked about how photography isn't your per, uh, isn't your passion, but okay. young people are. But the dope thing is that photography puts you in the presence of young people. And so it to does. someone out there, I would tell them, like, do things 
try things, mm -hmm. right? Everything. Be a contributor, <laughs> right? Because yeah. then you will end up figuring out like, oh, I thought the corporate didn't mean that. I thought God wanted me to just go this route in ministry and leave corporate alone. And then I realized I'm like, if I'm being real, the experiences I've gained from corporate, like local ministry would have never been able to provide me in yeah. a real way, you know? And so um, doing both of those things balances some things out and gives us some perspective. So um, yeah. I, I just love that you said that, that it's not your passion, but it puts you in that purpose um, with young people that God called you to. So that's pretty dope. Um, and that makes me uh, think about, can I add something to it? Yeah, for it, sure. Let's go ahead. It makes me think about a couple people. It makes me think about Moses. God sent Moses to go and talk to talk to Pharaoh. Moses said, "I got, I can't speak. I'm uh, 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 right. like you. Yeah, I'm not a public speaker. Well, it's not me." <laughs> and God was like, "Go." And then God got mad. I was like, well, "Let me take this. Okay, you can go with you." But like, this wasn't something Moses was confident in. It wasn't something that he was good at. And ultimately, he still had he, to choose to obey so that God could get the glory. But that was probably uncomfortable, full of fear probably felt crazy you know and then you think about Daniel though who had great wisdom great intellect great great talent but he was they were in you know they were in um I would say bondage but they were they were captive they were captive yeah. in um a pagan society in a society different than their beliefs and he was called to the to the highest places in government and in, you know in these places uncompromised but are we able to withstand that kind of testing or Joseph having a vision in these dreams early, but having to be in jail, having to be, you know, accused of some of, of rape and all, you know, all of these things. Like, I think that one thing that has preserved me, but it sometimes has made me feel like I'm missing out is that it's, I've always had this, this, this ideal of delayed gratification. You, it's not about suffering and enduring just for the sake of suffering, but it's that, in time, things will happen. Like I've seen God be God. So even though this is taking a year or 10 years or 12 years, like I'm going to trust that it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen the way I want it or as quickly as I want it, it's going to work something out in me. In college, God was like, look at some of your favorite worship leaders. How old are they? And I was like, oh, they're kind of in their 30s. Because I would be upset. I'm like, Lord, I know you called me to teach. I know you called me to do these things in the kingdom. How come you keep sitting me down? How come I see my friends doing this and doing that and doing that? Or I'm getting all these deep, heavy convictions about things and and my mom, my mom would tell me, she was like, you know, in the beginning, she was like, it's going to feel bad because the Lord is showing you things or that or because you're choosing to 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 follow what the voice of the Lord is saying. She said, but in the end, it's always going to work out to your benefit. It's always going to be be better. And I think that um, I've been very unsatisfied in a lot of my jobs and a lot of my work. I've been unsatisfied in photography sometimes, but I've endured long enough to see God let it all come together for something that's going to be deeply fulfilling. Um, not just because I need to be fulfilled, but because he used it all and I was able to wait and he'll honor that and use it for his glory. Um, someone told me earlier or, or sometime last year, like, you know, I, I can tell that you've been unfulfilled in some things. Somebody who don't know me, you know, sometimes people come up to you, they prophetic, you'd be like, you look crazy. But <laughs> they were like, well, fulfillment is coming. And I was like, and I appreciated that. And I hold on to that. Cause I'm like, most people think like, oh, you living the, your best life. You got a business, you this, you that I see you here, you know, you're doing that by proximity. And I'm like, no, like I've been doing this and enduring through this, trying to figure out growing in business and changing my mindset. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. My parents were entrepreneurs. My dad's had owned a business here in Flint for 25 plus years. My brother's an entrepreneur. Just look, just drop some sneakers. I'm throwing that out there. Ooh, I saw that on your <laughs> oh. um, on your Instagram. Okay. Yeah, so you, that, I had so that's noticed, your brother. I, he just designed yeah. those. Yeah, he designed okay. them in a collaborative project. He's creative. He has a business. I don't want to. I just wanted. I did not want to have a business. I want to be somebody's youth pastor, running around after their kids, helping to support parents and kids in that way. God shut that down every time. <laughs> and I and I didn't I'm like marketplace. I was like, I don't want to be in the marketplace trying to do ministry. And here I am 15 years later, <laughs> submitted and surrendered, doing something yeah. that I love in a way I had no idea that I, I wouldn't have chose it. You know what, though, like you said some dope stuff, like you preached the whole message. I don't even know if you really, really realize like you just preach. And I'm going to tell you what what really resonated with me is. Um, so I have it up on my phone. I've kept this up on my phone for the last week is the idea of a time horizon. 
So, you know, full transparency, like when I was originally looking at this definition and thinking through this, it was more around like investment and my investment strategies over the past years or whatever. And one of the things you learn and like I I try to look at the word of God first and then filter what I do in business, invest in those things through the lens of that. (laughs) Right. Um, Versus just because otherwise you could just get caught up being money hungry, greedy, opportunistic and all those things. But what you talked about, that that ability to have delayed gratification, right? So many of us struggle with that because we think what is today will always be. But I always tell people, like, if you go back to um, 1999 or let's go 2000, I'm just trying to go to the the time before the Internet and social media really was what it is today, right? Um. There's a lot of people, almost anybody who was alive during that time and was, you know, 15 years old or whatever, let's say, they had the opportunity to purchase Apple stock, as an example. Like, it was there. Amazon stock was there. Netflix Mm -hmm. was there, right? But if I would have came up to you in 2000 and and said, hey, man, you know, there's this Apple stock. This is going to be something. In that moment, you would not, or Amazon, in that moment, you wouldn't have been able to even take me serious. You'd have been like, what? Because I'm too early, right? Sometimes we're too early in seeing what God is going to do. And when you're early, you look crazy. You're like, what you have to for that for? Like, what (laughs) what are you doing? Like, because you're early. But then if you're just patient enough to give it enough time to go by, then everybody else starts jumping on board. And that's actually from an investment standpoint, when there is the biggest, the greatest opportunity for gain is once when you've been early and then people jump on. So for me, I look at that through the lens of a believer of like whatever God is doing in our lives today, like we have to have um, some type of um, understanding of how time works and understand that where you are today is not where you will always be. And sometimes we make we make life changing decisions based on today as if this as if this good or bad is going to always be your life and where it really helps us is for the good things right things that are going good in my life it causes me to be grateful and understanding that there are some things that are going well that i don't want to take for granted that i think they're just going to all i'm entitled to them going well but then things that i'm working through and challenged through is like hey it's not going to always be this bad and keep going so to me it's understanding that and then the other part that you said that's really dope and it made me think about it's the fact that like some of us are so concerned about what everybody thinks we can't go through the through the rough patches of our lives. And this yeah. is an important sometimes the importance of turning your phone off, getting yeah. off of social media and everything is because yeah. we don't allow each other to struggle because, you know, if, if I was if I was if people were seeing me struggle, they might judge me. They might. You know, everything is oh, funny yeah. to everybody now. I might be the a meme, the butt of somebody's joke. And I think mm-hmm. we live in a society where there's so much pressure for per- perfection that the people who are yes. struggling, they're struggling silently because I don't want to tell nobody because like I got this many followers or, you know, we trying to live up to these Man. brands and things versus just being a person. So. Yeah, I got all that from what you said. Great. Oh, well, man, but that's that's life. And I'm getting a lot from what you're saying, because it's true. Like how how have we created you know, the literal title is influencer. And so I'm like, I'm like, even adults, we walk around like things don't influence us. We act like music don't influence us. What we desire, like people don't influence us. By nature, like if we're spiritual beings, like th- everything's going to have some influence, whether you are aware of it or not, um, whether you perceive it or not. And so it's just like, how how are we, how are we turning into this society that's so front facing that we're saying that we're being authentic, but people really really like they don't know how and some of these people are doing stuff in content and stuff and they they're they're being authentic but they don't know themselves they don't have they're not established in their identity or at least in the basis of like the, the base of their character but it's i think that's it's crazy i think that we are in a in a, a very diluted time <laughs> and, yeah. no, and none of us are above being deceived like i don't say that from this hilltop of like i can no I didn't been deceived before. I've been thinking I've been at doing one thing and it's not that, or I've, I've been deceived by people. Like, and in the end, like it says that even the very elect, like the, the very elect could be deceived. Like if, if the Lord doesn't come in and kind of snatch us out. So it's like, we have to be humble enough to know that 
you know, we when we miss our mark, like we can be deceived, but also know that like you don't have to live your life for these views and these likes and these people, especially if it's a, it's not the life that is actually you. Like, and we talked to our young people about that. Like this last session, like faking it till you make it. Like, like what's up with that? Like, why do you feel like you need to do that? Why are you lying online? Who are you trying to impress? Like, what? Um, at the very least, to get them thinking about these things, so that hopefully, as they grow in their lives, and if they want to do content stuff, that they can identify okay, I'm doing this because I know if I do this, it's going to cause this type of reaction. And maybe they'll have a checkpoint in their mind and say, that's not authentic or that's not that's not right or that's not good. Or I'm just doing this because I want some people to laugh, but it's some, to somebody's detriment. Like we want to be able to instill those checkpoints and that dissonance so that they can, can navigate this stuff better. Because we see as adults, we don't always navigate it well. And then you add money and pressure and all this other stuff to it. Like they're going to... We got we to gotta be able to to combat that. Yeah, and any of us, you said, I love that you said that, like any of us could fall victim of that, like me included. And I think yeah. that's what some people, people mistaken when you talk about something that you're concerned about as if you think you're exempt. It's like, no, I'm concerned yeah. for me, for you, for all of us that we're living in this society and we're just accepting and willingly living in a society where we're going to apply pressure yeah. to each other because we're all faking and we're trying to be something we're not with our content, with whatever. And even, you know, like we talked yeah. about, like trying to live up to these status symbols. And that's why with me, where it's like what I've tried to do. Right. And I, and again, I'm constantly observing and critiquing my own content to make sure yeah. that I'm keeping the focus. But what I've tried to do is focus more on the how to than the what. And what I mean by that is like there are so many people because I talk about, you know, finances and, mm -hmm. and business a lot. It's like what yeah. I'm trying to do in real time is actually show people a playbook to escape poverty because I grew up in po in and around poverty yeah. and understand how damaging it is um, spiritually, physically, financially and all, in so many ways. But what's crazy to me is that people don't want to hear it unless you're showing them something. And I made a yeah. conscious decision like, I'm not here to show you a car, a house. I'm not here to show you anything if you're not going to, if you're not yeah. going to appreciate substance and be attracted to substance, then you're going to miss what I'm trying to do because yeah. then now I'm putting myself in this weird position. Uh, let's say as an example, I try, start trying to like show people cars and say, hey, you should listen to Inspire Guys people because yeah. I was broke and I got this kind of car. And then it's like, now what happened if I lose that car? Now my whole identity is wrapped up in when you see me or when I'm out, I got to be wearing this. Yeah. Like I tell people all the time, no, you catch me in the grocery store. I saw this dude the other day. Only mm -hmm. reason I didn't say what up, because I get confused with do I know people in real life or do I know <laughs> from the internet? Because I, I don't forget faces. But I saw this That's dude in the funny. grocery store. We we looked at each other. I was like, dang, he probably thinking like, I'm, when I tell you I go to the grocery store looking like somebody crazy uncle like i throw on whatever jogging pants whatever gym you shoes like at the door. walmart <laughs> oh man i go I, it's bad i'm not gonna lie it's bad i'd be comfortable but it's bad but my point with all of that is even with all of that it's like for me i'm like man i'm sorry i'm not about to i'm not about to turn going to the grocery store or the car wash into like me <laughs> having to like get dressed for y'all if you gonna judge me because i look toe up today then guess what? That's just what it is. And so I think we have to be comfortable. We have to learn how to become more comfortable with who we really are and allow Absolutely. people to think and feel what they want to, you know. Um, uh, 1,000% agree. I've, I've enjoyed this, Alexandria. Look, I want to um, I want to do a couple rapid fire before we get out of here. And shout out to okay. everybody in the comments. Um, appreciate. Hey, um, oh, I love y'all. Um, I see you got some people in here, some of your people that yeah, rock with you. Thank y'all. Um, couple, couple rapid fire, just quick, you know, thirty seconds okay. left, less answers. I got me talking long, <laughs> long oh, no, and strong. No, you, oh, trust <laughs> me, like you, I'm more so trying to be respectful of your time. I will be here all day dealing with me because I love talking through this stuff. Listen, um, I, I have no problem, but I understand we got time frames. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I want to um ask you a couple of things, just things I saw okay. on your website, or um, and like things you said about yourself that were interesting okay. to me, right? Okay. Um, so the first one that stood out is you call yourself an ambivert. Um, I never 
ever hear that's what I call myself. Whenever I'm introducing yeah. myself to my, a new team at work or something, that's on my yeah. slide. Um, a lot of people don't know what an amb- ambivert is or why you would call yourself that. So can you tell us, yeah. you know, a little bit about why you call yourself an ambivert? Most people who meet me think that I am an extrovert. I'm loud. <laughs> probably catch me doing something silly i'm very unserious but i'm also very serious um and so i i think naturally i probably had some introverts i'm some extrovert tendencies but i am actually more of an introvert and so i charge i recharge by myself i like my alone time i like quiet i like stillness i don't need to be doing a lot um and so what i found when i did like one of those personality tests that i really fell in the middle i was like 51 percent introvert and like 49% extrovert and what they call it as an ambivert. And so earlier I said that I'm really this split of like uh, technical mind and creative. I found in my life that I am often kind of not emotionally, but uh, in a lot of things, very extremes. I'm like all the way over here on this, but I'm also this. And so um, I think that that tension though allows me to flow in and out of a lot of stuff really well. I love it. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually the same way, believe it or not. Um, Ambivert for, almost identical reasons that you said, um, very creative person. And I'll give you an example of where sometimes that's challenging. Um, when I'm in the creative world and around my people who make music and things like that, those people are not technical at all. They don't like business at all. And so it's like all creative. And I'm like constantly sometimes talking to them like, hey, bro, you got to do A, B, and C. Or what about this part in your... Like, I know we dropping albums or like we want to invest in this, but like you need to get your credit together. And then I go to the to the business <laughs> like world. To this. So, yeah, so like and like it's, it's some balance. And then I go to the business yeah. world and I'm like, sometimes people lack so much creativity. They're just all technical. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. so, yeah, it's weird. It could be a gift in a lot of ways because it allows you to navigate. And it could be challenging sometimes because you never actually feel 100 percent. Um, align with the things that yeah. you are into in every group you could feel like a contrarian yeah. so interesting yeah. okay next next it's rapid fire <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> um next rapid fire i want to ask you about this uh this idea that you want to spend a season of your life as a nomad why <laughs> would someone want to do that why do you want to do that and what do you <laughs> plan to get out of that season of your life i i don't know that it'll ever happen i remember in college i wanted to um to I'm gonna go backpack. My mom was like, girl, you better get your head head out the sky. But I also was like, later on, I was like, it's just some stuff that black people ain't seen yet. And later on in life, you realize it's some other people out here doing this fine. She was like, you ain't got no money. Uh, you ain't never been no, you know, she was like, you know, go travel and do stuff, but you gonna backpack across where? And so I, I've always been kind of the hippie of my family in a sense. <laughs> like, okay. um, and so for me, I watch a lot of YouTube channels of like people who live full time on the road, maybe in a, van, in a sprinter van or they're traveling. And for me, I, I think that that's cool. And as a single person, like that ideal of like solace and that introverted part of me is like, I get to enjoy a lot of different things and kind of take my life with me as I go. So I think that's the biggest piece of it. Um, I don't know if I want to be crammed in a van with a husband and <laughs> and we in there like this, but I like right. the ideal of moving from place to place and seeing new things, eating new food because I love food and uh, you know doing something that a little was, different. Conventional that was, the next, one. That was yeah. the next one I was going to ask about this idea that food Feed is your me. love language. Like, Feed me. <laughs> okay. Let's All cook. Right, so- let's eat. <laughs> All right, so I got a question along those lines then. Okay. Where where do you have a favorite restaurant? Whether it be, you know, I know you're from Flint, yeah. you spent time in Detroit. Where's uh somewhere that you like to eat or a favorite food in general? So I suck at favorites, so I don't really have a favorite restaurant, but I just like to eat. Like if we're gonna travel somewhere, some people are like I want to see the museums, I want to do what the people do. I'm like looking up all the restaurants, looking at the pictures, trying to figure out what I want to eat. So I um yeah, I don't have any favorites. I love everything. Indian food, Thai food, black folk food, Mexican food. Like I um okay. I love to cook. I love, you know, so no favorites. Just feed me. Like Okay. <laughs> when my food friends is, and I leave up, is... we get some food, take a nap on the couch and then get up and talk about deep stuff. <laughs> so food is really the love language. Got you. Well, look, yeah. before we get out of here, can you just tell the people where they can find you, where they contact you if they want to get some photos, if someone wants mm-hmm. to learn about your youth program and follow that, like tell them where they yeah. can find you and how they can stay connected. 
All right. So on social media, my business is Alexandria Chrisell Photo. And um, that's also my website, alexandriacrisellphoto.com. And there you'll find all of my uh, high school seniors, headshot and branding stuff. Um, and also the youth program information is housed there as well. The young influencers on online for the young influencers. IG is the uh, period young influencers. Same on TikTok um, and also on Facebook. Um, and then I pivoted my, my business because one of the things is I need to free up time to be able to do more with the young influencers. And also kind of after my mom passed away, I just didn't feel like I had the capacity to do a lot of one off stuff as I pivoted to um, a business called Alongside Multimedia Agency. And we are tackling a large scale event um, and conference uh, photo content, uh, video coverage. Um, and we also offer headshot stations for conferences who want to kind of elevate what they provide their attendees to. So we do we have a system where we can come in and do headshots rather quickly for large amounts of student i mean amounts of attendees and also deliver that quickly so three different things and that's at alongside ma um, on instagram um, and alongside ma.com for the website that's dope what are um just what are some big events that you've had the opportunity to work on uh, I have been a part of TEDx Detroit for the last four or five years, and that's always fun because you get to meet people and the speakers, and um, I've done the speaker headshots there. Um, obviously, anything that I've done for my brother, my brother uh, had um, partnerships with the Detroit Pistons and um, Tom, is it Tom Gore? Sorry if I'm getting it wrong. And he did courts here in Flint where he designed and painted those courts, and so I've been able to help capture some of that. I'm sure there's other dope things that I've done places, but I'm I'm trying to think. I've I've done stuff for Foot Locker. I've done stuff for local brands and some national brands too. But I don't be keeping score enough to recall them. But I'm grateful that I've had a lot of really cool opportunities. Uh oh, Brooklyn Nets. I got to do media day for the Brooklyn Nets a few years ago too with a friend. Um, and nice. so that was cool. Yeah. Well, Alexandria, I could tell you, man, this has been um, a joy for me. I definitely appreciate. I've enjoyed you. it so much too. Um, <laughs> I'm inspired by what you're doing in the community, inspired Thank by your faith, your tenacity, um, and your focus on young people. Um, keep going, man. Like one thing I will say Thank is you. we need more people like you in the body of Christ doing it in this authentic way, right? This that is yeah. just I just resonate with and I've appreciated for a long time from afar and was looking forward to having a conversation with you on Inspire Guys People, and it was definitely well worth it to me. So uh, please do stay in touch. You know, don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. Please, community, um, Inspire Guys People community, check out Alexandria and the work that she's doing. Okay. Keep her in your prayers and all that good stuff. And y'all have an amazing day hey, out there. I gotta tell you thank you, though. Let me tell okay, you thank ahead. you first because I'm, go ahead, go ahead. I want to say thank you to you and that I'm inspired by you because I don't know how many people follow you if they knew or if they they true, but... Mm -hmm. You be dropping nuggets. I be reposting and, and copying and pasting your stuff everywhere. So I, I'm grateful that um, you you felt you know that I would be a good person to come here, and I've enjoyed our conversation. And I also appreciate real people. And so I just want to say thank you, um, and that you're dope also. So you gotta let me say thank you too before we got off. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what's up. I appreciate you, and much love to everybody in the comments. Y'all stay connected. Yeah, um, yeah. Inspire guys, people on YouTube. Um, you will see. Um, this interview and then the daily, you'll see a lot of stuff chopped up. There's a lot of uh, good things said today. So we drop daily inspiration at Inspire Guys People on YouTube, uh, continuing to grow that. And you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those things. I always tell people, look, if you enjoy the content of this show, the first four years of Inspire Guys People happened on audio before I went to video podcasting. And so there's about 160 episodes of audio Inspire Guys People on Apple Podcasts. I've interviewed some amazing people, CEOs of banks. We had Montel Jordan on one time. We had all kind of people that I've interviewed and talked to on the audio show. So, um, yeah, check that out, and hopefully you will be blessed. The other thing about that is that's where I spent a lot of time talking through the foundation of the show, especially because I tap, uh, tap into – uh, the business world a lot and I talk about investing and money and some people you know they hear those type of things and then they can lose track of the fact that this is happening through the lens of the Bible so I spent about a hundred and something episodes making sure people understood this was about the Bible talking about why I talk about money and those type of things so if you ever kind of question it like what is Jermaine on or something like that I advise you to check out Inspire Guys People on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and anywhere else where you can listen to podcasts Alexandria this has been amazing 
listeners, y'all be blessed, Agreed. stay in touch, all that good.